we'll please welcome back Eve Lee. She's an undergrad and one of the masters here. She's currently at Berkeley, finishing her PhD with Eugene Chen. This is the midway point of a whirlwind tour of all the top universities. And uh, she's here to tell us about stewards, supercuffs, and Doritos. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'd like to talk about the formation of small planets, which Matt nicely described as indeed the super Earths, super Earths and the super puffs. And I'm going to show you that the late stages of disk evolution provides a natural birthing ground of these planets of just a few Earth masses. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll talk about the dynamical signatures that these planets impart on debris disks. Um, exploring with the possibilities that these planets not only populate the inner regions, which is what I'm going to talk about in the formation scenario, but also the outer regions of the planetary systems, which is what I'm going to talk about in the second part of the talk in the debris disk case. So when we look at the detected exoplanets on the radius versus orbital period diagram, we see multiple clusters, but for today, I'm only going to look at this colorful blob. Most of this is super Earth. So to date, this is the most common types of planets detected, found in about 50% of all sun-like stars. And at least for the planets where we can measure their mass by radial velocities, um, their mass ranges from about 2 to 20 Earth masses. And for the purpose of this talk by super Earth, I'm talking about any planets that's larger than the Earth and smaller than the Neptune. And then I'll talk about, also talk about the super puffs. These are much rarer than the super Earths. And these are the planets that's larger than the Neptune, but with mass that can be as small as two Earth masses. So these are characterized by extreme low densities. So I'll first talk about the formation of super Earths, which is interesting because of their ubiquity. If we can understand how these planets form, then we can gain some insight into the default formation pathway of planets in general. So one of the riddles posed by the super Earths is that they are not gas giants. When we look at the, oh, there we go. When we look at the distribution of their masses, as I said, it ranges from about 2 to 20 Earth masses, but a good number of these have mass that's larger than 5 or even 10 Earth masses, which is the typically quoted critical core mass that sees the formation of gas giants. But because these are smaller than Neptune, to explain both their mass and radii, we infer their envelope mass fraction to range from about 0.1 to 10%. But if we take a large mass core, like say seven Earth mass core, and then throw it in a gaseous nebula that lives for say about 10 million years, then well within that time scale, the mass in the envelope that got accreted becomes comparable to the mass in the core, which triggers this runaway gas accretion. So this seven Earth mass core is fated to becoming a gas giant. So then how did this massive super Earth avoid this runaway gas accretion and have their envelope mass growth stunted at about a few percent value? To answer that question, we need to first understand the physics of accretion, which in this case is really just physics of cooling. So again, let's do a thought experiment. Throw a rock in a gaseous nebula, then any gas within its hill radius will be bound to the core and form an envelope. That envelope is going to cool and contract over time which leaves some empty room for the ambient gas to refill. So the time scale of accretion is set by the time scale of cooling. So that's the basic physical picture that we should keep in mind. And with that, I am now going to build a numerical model to calculate the time evolution of the envelope mass fraction of a core of a given mass in a given nebular condition. And the goal is to find the right nebular condition in which the super Earth cores can emerge with a few percent envelope mass fraction. So the procedure we follow is, I have to say, heavily motivated by the work done by Anna Maria Pizzo with Andrew Yudin, who's no stranger to CETA, and also Ruth Murray Clay. But to summarize, we first build the individual hydrostatic snapshots each corresponding to different envelope mass fraction. 
And then we calculate the time it takes to go from one snapshot to the next. So what goes into these individual hydrostatic snapshots? It's really nothing more than solution to stellar structure equations, which we all learn in our stellar stars class. So the only difference is that these are not isolated objects. They connect smoothly to the disk. And also, there's a solid core at the bottom. So to solve these stellar structure equations, we need opacities. We take the tabulated opacities to experiment between whether there's a dust grain in the envelope or not. So we take Ferguson at all for dusty, Friedman at all for dust free. And then we build our own equation of state so that we can experiment with the different degrees of metallicity and also to make sure that we capture the physics of the hydrogen molecule dissociation, which turns out to be very important in the thermal evolution of these envelopes. So I'm gonna now go uh, straight to the result. So when we, have, when we have five Earth mass core sitting in the standard minimum mass extrasolar nebula, which by the way is just five times the minimum mass solar nebula, so they're really not that different. And in that case, this five Earth mass core will go through the runaway within 20 million years. And if you cut it off at 10 million years, then it accretes about 50% envelope mass fraction, which is way too large to explain the current super Earth. Yes. Right, so what I'm doing is at the outer boundary, I'm setting both the density and temperature to that of the disk. So, so in this picture where this five Earth mass core accretes way too much gas, I'm implicitly assuming that the cores emerge and start accreting at the very early stages of disk evolution. But what if the cores form late in the stage where the disk density is depleted in gas. Something that might remind us of the inner cavities of transitional disks. And also, when we look at the young star clusters, we find that only about 10% of the total stellar population have these signatures of this inner cavity as seen in their SCDs. So if we can assume that all the disks go through this phase of transitional disks, this inside out clearing, then we can say that only the last 10% of the total disk lifetime is spent in this depleted, depleted inner disk condition. So, yes? This inside out clearing, is this basically something like a radiation pressure or wind effect from the stars? Um, what's causing it? So there are different theories. So at least for the ones that have small cavities, and by small cavities I'm talking about inside 1AU, then that could be explained by what's called the photoevaporative gap. So basically you have the accretion of gas through the disk, and then you have the photoevaporation from the stars, the, high, the UV and X-rays um, launching winds off the, off the outer surface. But when the, the mass loss rate from the wind and the accretion rate matches, then you can start clearing out a gap at about 1 AU because that's the wind launching radius then what happens is the inner disk gets cut off from the outer disk, and the inner disk will very efficiently be um, accreted onto the star. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so, so that's one way to explain it. Right, so in this depleted, depleted inner regions that's short-lived, then this five Earth mass core can build about 7% envelope mass fraction and successfully become a super Earth. So now with this picture, some of you might wonder, well, like, does this require some fine tuning in the disk properties? So I'm now gonna demonstrate that that is not the case. So what I'm gonna do is, um, let's look at this final envelope mass fraction. This red curve is set where the disk is depleted by two orders of magnitude. I'm gonna deplete this further and further and see what happens to this final envelope mass fraction. So three orders of magnitude depletion, very little change. Five orders of magnitude depletion, again, very little change. And then even if I go down to seven orders of magnitude depletion, um, the maximum factor of change that you get is about a factor of three. 
So this means that there is no need to fine tune the degree of depletion in the gas. It's just that whatever it is has to be maintained on a million year time scale. Just a question. So the bonding equation rates are always sufficient? Yes. Uh, that's assumption or that's uh, the bonding accretion? Well, the thing is accreting its bonding spheres, but is there enough uh, end up coming in to supply its growth? Oh, I see. Um, so, so if you're asking about the accretion onto the core, you actually have to look at the time, the longest time scale, right? And bonding accretion time scale is way too short, so you're always limited by cooling. Right, so the question is that you reduce it to one, two, three, seven orders of magnitude. Right. This, what's the end dot? Ah, uh, I see, right. So, um. Oh, uh, right. So, as long as you have some level of gas in terms of just accreting that onto the core, it's fine, right? Because whatever gas is inside the heat radius, like, it will not be evacuated. Tell for sure that the gas supply can keep up with the quasi static model. Because you have a quasi static model that assumes you're able to uh, bridge the gap between the envelope and the disk at the disk density at the outer boundary at all times. And once the density goes down enough, you may not be able to bring in the matter rapidly to the temperature. Right. So, like it. Um, so like, so that is actually the replenishment, the question in the replenishment, right? Like is the replenishment rate enough in the, in the disk region? So the M dot, if you, and it depends on your favorite viscosity parameter, mm -hmm. right? Assuming that it's a viscous refill. Well, no, it's pressure um, oh, Sorry, sorry for pinning you out, but yeah, that, that would be one thing I'll worry about. Okay. Oh, okay. So for bond rate, actually, I won't be I won't be worried about bond rate at all, even if it's a like very depleted stage, because it's really efficient at the full at the full maximum. It's so efficient that I don't need to worry at all. So I would actually, so I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I would not be worried. Well, that makes sense at some level because you're dealing with like a million orbits. So a million orbits is a lot of sound crossing temperature. Right. And so, so if you, you gain one disk density for sound crossing time, which is a lot of then you have enough time to build up. Okay, I just need kind of a little bit Okay. All right. So, so as I said, um, this degree of depletion just needs to be maintained on a million year time scale. And at least observationally, we do see significant amount of accretion onto the star, which means that there's a lot of gas still going through these inner cavities. Um, so at least observationally, it seems consistent with the general idea that, the, that this core starts accreting gas in this depleted region. And even in that depleted region, um, it gets replenished for a long enough time. Yes? My question is, isn't the whole idea that started the photo evaporation thing in the first place is how to clear the disk really, really quickly. So, when so that's once you clear it up, then it starts, um, so once you form a gap, then the inner material gets accreted really quickly, but it takes time to reach that stage where you can clear out a gap. So to clear out the gap, you actually need to deplete the gas by a certain amount. Okay, so that was about the th um, densities. Now, what about the time scale? So I talked about about a million year time scale for this for this uh, full accretion of the envelope onto the core. But what would happen if I shortened that time scale even more? So this final envelope mass fraction is actually set by the condition where the cooling time scale is equal to the remaining disk lifetime. <coughs> And then now if I go down to, let's say, 0.1 million year, then I still get about a few percent envelope mass fraction. And even if I go down to 10,000 years, 
I still get about a percent envelope mass fraction. So what? So that's thanks to the fact that the envelope mass grows slowly with time, about square root with time. So that means that the remaining disk lifetime can be as short as 10,000 years and as long as a million year. So the point is that there is a rather large room to play with the time scale. So this, uh, this talks about the robustness of our result on the different degrees of density depletion and also the remaining lifetime of the disk. So why is it that the atmospheres grow the same way irrespective of nebular density? So to understand that, we need to look at the atmospheric structures. In general, we have the outer radiative zone and the inner convective zone. And turns out most of the mass and therefore energy is inside this convective zone, which means that the cooling time scale of the entire envelope is actually set by the cooling time scale of this inner convective zone. But then the rate of convective energy transport is very sensitive to this boundary condition. So it's the thermodynamic properties of the boundary between the convective and radiative zone that controls the rate of cooling. So when we compare this boundary for the envelope sitting in different nebula of different density depletion, we see that both the density and the temperature at that boundary is about the same. In fact, the temperature at this boundary is about 2700 Kelvin, and that is coincident on the H2 dissociation front. So what happens is you have these free hydrogen atoms, it can combine with the free electrons and form H minus ions. And at hotter temperatures, they start to dominate the total opacity. And because it's so sensitive to temperature, you have the surge of opacity on the inside, which ensures that convection prevails. So because the emergence of this radiative convective boundary is set by the quantum mechanics of H2 dissociation and the formation of H minus ions, it's decoupled from what happens on the outside. So because of this decoupling, the, uh, the rate of cooling doesn't really depend on the nebula conditions and therefore the accretion rate doesn't really depend on the nebula density. And that is why we had the result where we could allow this many orders of magnitude depletion and still had a, about the same final envelope mass fraction. So during this uh, whole calculation, I've actually assumed that the entire envelope is optically thick, but as you deplete the disk gas further and further, at some point, the disk will become optically thin to the stellar light. So there will be some stellar irradiation onto these envelopes. So I'm now looking at what happens to the accretion rate onto these cores as I allow the emergence of the outer optically thin layer. So I'm using the two-stream approximation by GEO, where I calculate the amount of stellar light that gets absorbed in the visible, and also the outgoing internal thermal emission for a given atmospheric layer. And in this case, the most important parameter is this gamma, which is the ratio between the visible opacity and the thermal opacity. So when gamma is less than one, then the thermal photosphere appears above the visible photosphere and the temperature will increase as you go to deeper and deeper layers. But when gamma is greater than one, then the visible photosphere appears above the thermal photosphere and that will cause temperature inversion. So depending on which opacity table I use, I get either gamma less than one or gamma greater than one, but I'm gonna show you right now that none of this really matters. So on the left side, I'm showing the time evolution of the envelope mass fraction, where in solid, I'm showing the case where I have this outer optically thin layer and the dashed, I'm showing the case where I assume that the entire envelope is optically thick. And you see that whether I have dusty, which, is, which gives you gamma greater than one, or dust free, which gives gamma less than one, the final envelope mass fraction only changes by at most factor of two. And the reason for this goes back to what I said about this decoupling between the radiated convective boundary and the outer conditions. So because this boundary is rather deep into the atmosphere, 
no matter how much adjustment you make to these outer layers, the, the boundary, the, this, both the pressure or density and temperature at that boundary will be pretty much consistent between these two different models. So our results that the super Earths can form in the depleted short-lived environment is robust against the different degrees of depletion in the gas density and the different remaining time scale and also whether you account for this outer optically thin layer or not. So I briefly mentioned that the robustness against the different time scale is due to the fact that the envelope grows rather slowly with time. Now I'm going to show you that all of us here can derive that within three lines. So we can start by saying that the accretion time scale is set by the cooling time scale, which is just energy divided by luminosity. But energy is just the atmosphere sitting in the potential of the core. So it's going to scale linearly with the envelope mass fraction. And then the cooling luminosity is set by radiative diffusion at the radiative convective boundary. So that's going to scale linearly with the photon mean free path, which scales inversely with the density and therefore inversely with the envelope mass fraction. Combine all of that, you will get time going as square of the envelope mass fraction, flip it, the envelope mass fraction will grow only as square root with time. Now if you're a bit more careful and do the analytic calculation, you get something rather nasty like this. But if you put in the right numbers, you will get the envelope mass grows as about time to the 0.4 power. And this plot just shows you that there is a very good agreement between the analytic calculation, which is in red, and the numerical calculation, which is in black. Now, one interesting thing that I found while doing both this numerical and analytic calculation is that there seems to be some special core mass that divides between two different growth modes. So this is the final envelope mass fraction plotted against the core mass. And if the core is less massive than about Earth mass, then they follow this steep curve and that's set by the isothermal atmospheres. So what that means is that these cores are so small that they just quickly gathered up the maximum possible atmosphere that it can accrete. And, and that's it. Once you reach isothermal atmosphere, you cannot cool anymore. But if you're more massive than about Earth mass, then you are massive enough that you can continue to cool um, before the disk goes away. And their envelope mass fraction is well described by, by what we've been discussing thus far, this still cooling atmosphere. So depending on your definition of this boundary between rocky versus non-rocky planet in terms of the final envelope mass fraction, this gives a theoretical expectation of what is the boundary between this non-rocky versus rocky in terms of the core mass. So in other words, what is the maximum possible rocky planet um, in terms of mass? And Conversely, what is the minimum core mass to have this non-rocky gas-laden planet? So now I'm going to give you a separate physical reason why we think the cores have to form late in the disk evolution. And this is coming from the perspective of core formation by giant impacts. So giant impacts, you start with the smaller protocores. But if they're just sitting in the very gas-rich environment, the gas dynamical friction will just damp away their eccentricities. So you end up with a system of circular orbits. You have to wait until the disk goes away so that the gravitational stirring between these bodies can pump their eccentricities and allow their orbits to cross. So we can approximate what is the required level of gas depletion to allow this orbit crossing by equating the gas uh, the gas dynamical friction, so eccentricity damping time scale, to the orbit crossing time scale. The orbit crossing time scale turns out is very sensitive to the orbital spacings. So what we can do is we take the current orbital spacing measured by um, Yan Chi Mu with with the student here um, um, from the Kepler multiplanetary systems. And it's, a, it's about 14, 12 to 14 mutual heat radii. 
And then we can back out what the orbital spacing was just prior to this last doubling. And within an error bar, you get about 7 to 11. And with those kind of orbital spacing, we find that you need to deplete the gas by at least four orders of magnitude to allow their orbits to cross. So that's a very heavily depleted environment. But just to remind you, I'm going to overlay here a rectangle that shows the range of density depletion in which the super Earth cores can emerge with a few percent envelope mass fraction. So not surprisingly, formally, you can allow about eight orders of magnitude range. So what does this mean? You need a, you need a very distended kind of environment in terms of the gas density to allow the cores to form by giant impacts. And even in that kind of depleted environment, super Earths can still form with their envelopes. Then we can go one step further and ask, when these super Earths form, will they stay there or will they migrate? So turns out, as long as the disk is depleted by more than four orders of magnitude, the type one migration time scale is longer than a million year. So that means that super Earths, when they form, is pretty much just going to sit there. So super Earths can form in situ in the depleted inner disks that's short lived. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the formation of super puffs. So to remind you, these are the planets that's larger than Neptune, but with mass that's as small as two Earth masses. So it's these three over here. And to explain their very low densities, we require their gas envelope mass fraction to range from about 20 to 40%. So how did this tiny two Earth mass core accrete this much gas? If you follow the standard cooling calculation that I've been talking about, then these two Earth mass cores will just become a super Earth. We need to go all the way up to this blue bar to explain the super puffs. So what can we do? Turns out, one thing you can do is first get rid of the dust. Maybe the dust grains coagulated and then settle down. And then put it far out, um, beyond 1 AU. Then in that case, a 2 Earth mass core can build 30% envelope mass fraction and successfully become a super puff. So why does this happen? So there is a difference between the dusty envelope versus the dust-free envelope. And one big difference is that for dust-free envelopes, the temperature at this radiative convective boundary is actually pretty much set by the disk temperature. So what that means is that this outer envelope is, the outer radiative zone is pretty much isothermal. So farther out you go, the colder the disk gets, and because for these dust-free envelopes, the gaseous molecules start to dominate the opacities, at cooler temperatures, the vibrational and rotational modes tend to be frozen out. So the opacity in general becomes lower. So that makes the envelope above the radiative convective boundary more transparent farther from the star, which will facilitate the radiative cooling and therefore, the dust-free envelopes will grow faster when it's colder. So let's collect it all back to the observations. Here I'm showing radius versus orbital semi-major axis. And I'm showing all the planets that's larger than fourth radii, where the red crosses are the gas giants and the blues are non-gas giants, with the larger blues corresponding to puffier planets. So I'm saying super puffs have to form out here. We currently see them down here. So that means that they must have migrated in. So in the, in the picture of the disk migration, convergent migration, the expectation is that the multiplanetary systems will be found close to the mean motion resonance. And kind of neat, but uh, at least for the currently observed systems harboring at least one super puff, they are found close to mean motion resonance. And Kepler-223 is actually found to be in mean motion resonance. And Right, so the 
point is that um, to be in mean motion resonance, um, the uh, there, there should be a light, uh, there should be basically like a libration of the um, libration of the resonant angles. So basically, um, to make sure that there is a the angles are commensurate to each other. So, so the time scales that you need to compare is the migration time scale versus the precession time scale of those different resonant angles. So it turns out for these small planets. So as long as you're smaller than about Jupiter, so like these few Earth mass planets, their migration time scale tends to be, tends to be um, long enough that they will, they tend to be, um, they tend to cross this uh, width of the resonance, so that libration width, and be locked in the resonance. Yeah. You, you marked out one which is a blue, but there are plenty of red crosses. Right. And we know those are in general not in new motion resonances, and they are what you call super puffs. Oh, uh, no. So the point of the super puff is that they have to be low mass. So these reds are actually rather high mass. Those are like 0.1 Jupiter mass. Well, okay. So, okay, so, so I guess another point is that the, the reason those are in resonance is because we can actually measure their masses. That's right. If they are in resonances. That's right. So you have bias yourself towards what's in resonance? That's right. Yeah. So what this says is that um, what we hope is that this could be the like, theoretical explanation why there is a bias. So to to actually quantify that, I'm currently working with Dan Fabricki and Jason Steffen to see that if there's any correlation between the planet bulk density and the distance to the resonance. And if there is that trend, then then that actually quantifies the um, then I think that actually quantifies this, what kind of bias you have to pick these puffy planets out from the like, TTV studies where you can actually measure the masses. Unfortunately, there is a bias which exactly allows you to do that. If you're closer to resonance, you can get lower mass and still get measured. Yes, I know. So that's a problem. I know. Yeah, I know, but it doesn't tell you anything about the radius though, right? So that's the extra information because that tells you that it's puffy. And what I'm saying is that puffier planets, I, th there's a theoretical expectation that puffier planets will be found close to the resonance. But you're saying there is, there is observational bias which also allows you to pick out puffier planets and resonances. Well, that's more of a, I think that's a more of a comment on the mass, right? It's that the smaller planets, uh, sorry, the low mass planets, if they're close to resonance, then you can pick them out. Right. That doesn't say anything about the radius. Doesn't uh, a larger radius make it easier to measure the transit times? There is a preference for larger radius. And so that would, that would give you a, at least a little bit of an observational bias. Oh, before. right. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Yeah. It might be quantifiable. Right. Yeah. But I would still argue that this this at least gives some also some theoretical expectation that there, it might be real on top of being having this observation of bias. I'm sorry, I, I understand the whole part. Why, where does the dust-free atmosphere come from? Where does the dust-free atmosphere come from? Yeah. So, um, so one way to think about it is that even if there was some dust in the nebula mm -hmm. and it gets accreted onto the envelope, the, you can calculate the dust settling time scale. So the idea is that the dust, once it gets uh, impinged onto the envelope, it settles down to the evaporation zone. Yeah, and why would this happen for the average product? Yeah, so um, um, I'm not really arguing one way or the other. The only statement that I'm making is that to have this very puffy systems, you have to have dust-free envelope. Super Earth can be dust-free too. But then it is puffy. Um, no, because you have to also go farther out. If they form in situ in the closing region, then it's fine. You, you won't be as puffy as these guys. Yeah. How much of a heat source do you need in order to drive convection? If you can, suppose you take your favorite model of the super uh, and then add some heat source to the center without thinking for a moment just exactly where it comes from. Because mm -hmm. if you have convection, obviously you can stir things up. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, so to keep these kind of envelope, which already has uh, this inner convective zone, you need about 10 to the 25 ergs per second. That's the kind of uh, that's the kind of power that you require. Yep. Sorry, uh, one question. Yeah. The only difference between regular superiors and possible superiors is possible from far, or it's called the. Wouldn't we expect to see way more of them than three? So actually, these are larger than fourth radii, right? So um, just from the Kepler statistics, these are much rarer than the planets that's smaller than fourth radii. Yeah, exactly. But uh, if they formed from, if the, if the only reason why they are far is because is because they are for, they formed really far, what it's called. Shouldn't we expect more of them? I mean, why would we have only expect like three or four systems to form to get this way? Oh, I see. So I don't really have an explanation for the system with just the super puff, but I have an explanation for the super puff with the super Earth companion. So super Earth have to like like I said have to form late, right? But then late enough that, late enough that um, it can form and barely migrate. But these guys, because they have to migrate, they have to form slightly earlier. So if you want to have these and super Earth on the inside, there is some fine tuning argument in terms of like when exactly they can appear. So that could actually say, why is it that they are so rare? Yeah, but wouldn't they have more time to form? Wouldn't they have more time to form? Yeah, because they can form early, right? So they can just form later if they want. Well, okay, I guess what I'm saying is that to explain the observed super puff systems, because they, because they are actually tend to be slightly farther out than the super Earths, um, they, they cannot form too early. They have to form slightly early enough, but like not too early, because otherwise they will just like push all the way through. Um, so I also told us that there are observed systems with super puffs in between two super Earths. Right, like this guy. Like this one, yeah. yeah. This one, this one, I'm not too sure, except for saying that for some reason this guy formed late. Yeah, but it's in the middle of the remittance as you're showing here. Um, then that says they migrated together, and then he said it forms outside, then it should also be a super Isn't that big? Yeah, except, like, like again, so let's say, this, let's say to explain this one particular system, one way to say it is that this guy somehow formed later than this core, but still because in the outer region you had, like somehow it got fine-tuned in a way that you still had enough time to migrate in, in a convergent manner. That's one way to figure it out, but like I agree that this doesn't quite fit nicely in the picture that I'm describing. All right. Okay, so I've talked a lot about formation. Um, now I'm going to talk about the aftermath of the planet formation, the debris disks, and, and the motivation for this particular project was that when we look at these different debris disks in the observations, in the scatter light images in optical or near infrared, we see many different shapes. Sometimes you see a ring, needle, or something rather bizarre like this fan-like shape. And we wanted to come up with a single theory to explain all these different shapes. And we're going to use the secular perturbation by an embedded eccentric planet, which is not a new idea. But what we're going to do is when we form this model debris disk, we are going to view it at different observing angle to unify this, these different debris disk images. And we are also going to show that you don't need the large mass planet to build these kind of kind of disks. You only need a few Earth mass planets. So this is, this is also exploring the possibilities that super Earths populate even the outer regions of, of planetary systems. So secular perturbation, let's say this blue is the perturbing planet's orbit and the red is the test particle. So the test particle is being perturbed by the planet, in which case the orbit precesses, and also its eccentricity changes. So just to go once more, because it's a short video. Um, so basically, the planet forces its eccentricity onto the disk. So again, the blue orbit is that of the planet with rather high eccentricities. And just outside, it's populated by these parent bodies, which you can think of it as just boulders. 
and in a configuration of a ring of width about 10%, and then this, this little um, gap between the planet's orbit and the parent bodies, that's the chaotic zone. Um, it's basically where there is an overlap between the first order mean motion resonances. So any test particles that happens to traverse there will be, um, will have their eccentricities um, random walk to very high eccentricities and basically uh, merge with either the planet or be ejected. So that is seen in even the solar system where here I'm showing the lifetime of the test particles around the, in the vicinity of the outer solar system planets. And as I promised, you, you don't need a large mass planet to build this kind of forced eccentric disk. So the way to calculate this is to compare the differential precession time scale, the precession time scale of the inner particle versus the outer particle, and compare that to the system time scale. So for the stars that harbor these debris disks, they tend to be about 10 million years. And then as long as the planet is at about 30 to about 200 AU, you only need about a few Earth masses. So think of these as super Earths sculpting these disks. So you have this ring kind of configuration, but these parent bodies will collide with each other and form smaller, smaller bodies. And then it's going to go down this collision cascade where the smaller bodies collide and form even smaller bodies all the way down to this blowout size where the grains are so small that they will be ejected to hyperbolic orbit by the radiation pressure from the star. And you can actually calculate what kind of size distribution you will have. So, um, so classically, people use this Donani size distribution, which is saying that regardless of the size of the grain, they will participate in an equal manner to these collisions. But because the smaller grains tend to be driven to higher eccentricities because they feel the radiation pressure, they will be protected from collision because in a Keplerian orbit, bodies tend to linger at the apostra. So if you correct for that, yes? Uh, what's the time scale of the driving of the grains outwards by this radiation pressure? The time scale? Um, it's fine if you don't have an immediate answer, just curious. Sorry? It's fine if you don't have an immediate answer, just curious. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh. So like if you're just thinking of like let's say it was originally originally like circular and then being driven, um, I think it's almost instantaneous, but like I don't have the actual number in my head, but I think it's pretty much instantaneous. Um, so if you correct for that collision, um, sorry, protection from the collision for the smaller grains, then what you'll find is that the emergent size distribution is rather it's rather bottom heavy. So most of the grains are small and on high eccentricity orbits. So what that means is that for these scatter light images that I'm going to produce, they are dominated by these very small grains. So here's the synthetic scatter light images by viewing that kind of model disk on a different observing angle. So here I'm showing the uh, face on view, which not surprisingly gives you the ring. Edge on view gives you the needle. And somewhere in between, already you see this fan-like shape that we've seen in the real-life debris disk. And just FYI, planet is just inside this dust cavity. So now I'm going to take each panel, or well, some of those panels, and compare it to the real-life debris disks. So edge on, you see a needle qualitatively in good agreement with the observations. And somewhere in between face on and edge on, you see this fan-like shape. So these are seen by the high eccentricity dust orbits that are launched from the parent body periastra. So just to guide your eye, this is what happens when you have, um, let's say my arm is the cavity and my head is the star. It's, this is seen when the apoapse of the cavity points towards you. So there are two parameters that control the exact morphologies of this fan-like shape. The first is the planet eccentricity. The higher the planet eccentricity, the more angled down the wings are, as you can see. And that's because for higher planet eccentricities, the dust orbits tend to be more absidally aligned. And it also matters where the dust grains are born. 
So, so far, I've actually assumed that uh, dust, the dust grain launch sites, which is just the collision sites, is sampled uniformly in the true anomaly, so just 0 to pi in an orbital phase angle. But you can also imagine that the collisions might preferentially occur near the apostra because that's where the bodies linger, which is on the right. Or you can think that the collision sites are preferentially near the periastra because that's where the relative velocities are the highest. So that's on the left. So as the launch sites get more concentrated toward the periastra, the wings appear more and go down. Again, because the dust orbits are more epsidally aligned with each other. What's really interesting is in the case where the launch sites are exclusively at the periastra, we see this double wing pattern. This is seen in real life in debris disks like HD32297. It's this faint little second wing. So why does this happen? If we take that model and view it on a face-on view, we still see the second wing. So this is not just some optical illusion. There's an actual local overdensity. So this occurs because of the combination of two effects. The first is that within an orbit, particles linger at the apostra. So that's where we're going to see some concentration. But when you have multiple orbits that are upsidedly aligned with each other, the orbit to orbit distance is larger at the apostra. So that tends to smear out the initial overdensity that you had. But the overdensity that you had at just off axis is still maintained, and that's what's giving you this second pair of wings. Yes? So you say that this can work for even low mass. Fjord mass. Is it the time, the age of the system, or the, the amount of mass in the disk? Oh, this is, the, this is a time scale argument. Yeah, so it's the time, so the system age. Sorry. Oh, I did not take that into account. Yeah. Right, and then we also find a new type of morphology that has yet to be seen, which is what we call as the bar. It really shows up when you, when you um, pass through this Gaussian high pass filter. So this bar appears just below the main disk. So this appears when, um, when, again, let's say my arm is the cavity and my head is the star. This appears when the periapse of the cavity points towards you. So the bar itself is caused by the force scattering by grains launched at the parent body's apostra. And this appears only when there's a pileup of small grains in the size distribution. So if observers can find this, then that could be an observational test of the grain size distribution. And in general, we find six distinct uh, morphological types of the debris disks in the scatter light images. So, so we could say that uh, the outskirts of planetary systems can be shaped by an eccentric planet of just a few Earth masses. So let me conclude with this summary slide. Question. Sorry, yes. In other words, is the optical depth ever larger than unity so that the radiation pressure is calculated and is modified by, by other grains along the line of sight? Uh, I see. So for debris, debris disks tend to be optically thin. So we don't worry about those. Okay. Yeah. But you have, okay, so there aren't any caustic slide structures we have to worry about this way. I don't think so. All right. So we first talked about the formation of super-Earths. Um, I've argued that they likely form in situ in the depleted inner nebula that's short-lived. And because these are, at least so far, the most common types of planets detected thus far, this could be the default formation pathway of planets in general. And then I talked about the super pups. I've argued that to explain their large radii for small masses, they have to form as the free world outside 1AU and then migrate in. So because of this formation uh, mechanism, um, I might expect to find high C2O ratio in the upper atmospheres of the super puffs. So the basic idea is that you're outside the ice line, the icy grains tend to be locked into the core, and because these have very thick outer radiative zone, there's no convective uh, dredge up all the way up to the photosphere where you have the detection. And then I, I did mention this 
I might expect to find some correlation between the bulk density and the proximity to resonance. And I am working on this already with Dan Fabrica and Jason Steffen, and at least preliminary results seems to be in agreement with the statement. And then in general, I might expect to find the planet bulk density to decrease with the distance from the star. And at least for the small number of systems where we do have the density measurements, this seems to be the case, but I think we really need more data. And then I talked about the unification of debris disk morphologies using the secular perturbation by an eccentric planet. So the farthest reaches of planetary systems may be perturbed by eccentric super-Earths rather than Jupiters. So perhaps we may have to wait until maybe W first um, or even Louvoir to really detect these planets at large distances. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I see. So you can do it for eccentricity by, um, by, for example, for the needle, the way they determine the eccentricity is to look at the offset between the, between the stellar position and, the, and basically the midpoint of their emission, emission disk. So that way you can, you can get the eccentricity of the planet. Um, but there is an inherent degeneracy between the orbital semi-major axis and the mass. So that's always going to come as a coupled um, or, um, variables. Um, how hot is the box exactly? How hot are they? Uh, currently? Yeah. So they are at the, the closest one is at 0.3 AU. So, so they are very hot? Uh, sure, but like I would say not hotter than the super Earth. Yeah, but so in this case, would it be expected of atmospheric ices to sublimate into gases? Atmospheric ices. So um, the, the oxygen, the atmosphere, mm -hmm. it, it, should, it should sublimate. Okay, but I guess what I'm saying is that like the ices that I might, like say water ices, mm -hmm. you already gather it up as a core material and yeah, it's already locked yeah, in. When you feed the gas, you're feeding the gas and the dust. Sure, but they will not dredge up all, all the way to the photosphere. That's my point. It's there on the inside, but you cannot see it on the, uh, at the photosphere. Yeah. I don't understand how, sorry, I don't understand how this gas accretion, you know, runaway happens at 50%. That's what we thought, right? It's a magic. You're going to get the exponential growth after that. So, do you have any idea why you could stop at 40%, 30%? Yeah, um, I really think that's just like, sort of like a time scale and sort of like a luck so that, a yeah, I think so. And like that might say something about why they're so rare too. Cause like you're sort of like, you know, like on the, on the uh, way towards right. the, uh, the runaway. Chelsea and I were writing paper based on some new really capital data of that. Lots of them actually are now stories. Between four to ten years from there. Oh, I, I see I'm only talking about the ones that are inside one AU, because in that case they are rare rar. I mean like they I'm not rare, saying rare. yeah, they are rare rar. Rare, rare, but yeah. they happen to nature a lot and I don't understand why they're stopping at thirty percent. Yeah, like for the outer for the outer plant, um, I guess like on the outskirts, I guess I'm not entirely sure. Like, is there still some, I think I'll have to see some evidence that um, there is the number statistics is sort of consistent among the different radii, like even at outskirts, then I might be like puzzled. But if there's like a dent at about like four to 10 or radii in a relative sense, then I'll say that it's still consistent with this core accretion picture. Is there a degeneracy in the super model between uh, light atmosphere on a denser core and a more compositionally homogeneous object with, say, icy, more, more icy composition? Right, so I think these are so big that um, in this case you really need these light atmospheres. Because mm -hmm. even with the light atmospheres, you're already on the verge of the runaway. But I mean, okay, but then there's not much degeneracy in the proportion of the light atmosphere and the iciness of the interior? Or 
I mean, because you, you still have the, uh, obviously, uh, there's a fundamental parameter, just the fraction of the mass that's actually given. Right. And, and so as you, you can change that parameter. You can also change the iciness of the, of the interior, can you? Oh, I see. The relative proportions of the mass of the interior that are rock versus. Oh, rock versus ice. Rock versus ice. Yeah, the size is really dominated by the outer, the, the gaseous molecules, the, the gas component. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't this bottom picture be fuzzy enough if you have more planets? Like, it, you seem to produce the observations well, but what happens when you have more planets? When I have more planets? Yeah, in causing the debris disk. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, you were asking what will happen if I have more than one planet. Yeah, um, so that's something we wanted to explore. We might still explore. I guess we kind of stopped that one because we could already reproduce the observations, but it's something to check for sure. Yeah. One last question. Okay, um, are you arguing that um, most of the cores that form outside of you, or the superplus form, don't come to us, don't become superplus? Perhaps because they're not dust free enough, that's just a small fraction managed to evade the runaway that we end up seeing. Right. The idea that it's a small superplus are just a, a tail of the distribution that are there, so most that form in that region wouldn't have those particular conditions, the dust wouldn't settle fast enough, for instance. Yeah, I, I think so. Like all of those can happen, right? To, to explain their relative rareness. But could, you, could, could you put a number on that, or is there a way to? Um, I'm a little wary to do that because I feel like there's so many variables in there, but it's something to look at. All right. Great. Thank you.